Hello, and welcome to A Gross of Physics. Today is day 57, and we're going to discuss Newton's Law of Universal Gravitation. Now, when I was in high school, this was my favorite topic that I learned in physics, because basically it states the following. Every object in the universe is attracted to me. Now, I've tried to live my life with that credo, but what you can realize is that no matter how bad you feel, no matter how low you may be, as long as you remember Newton's Law of Universal Gravitation, you'll feel a little better. Every single object in the universe that has mass is attracted to every other object in the universe. Now that simply states Newton's Law of Universal Gravitation. Any two objects have a force of attraction between them. Now Newton was able to come up with a mathematical relationship to that, but simply stated, because of Newton's third law, every object, every action has an equal and opposite reaction, if one object is attracted to another object, the same is true for the previous object. So if you have um, two objects and they are a meter apart, there's an attractiveness between the two. Now what we notice more commonly is the attractiveness between the Earth and us, the force of gravity. Now Newton's universal law of gravitation allows us to calculate the force between any two objects. What we actually do when we find the force of gravity on an object is simplify this equation because certain variables are always the same. In fact, we can find g, which is 9.8 meters per second squared, using Newton's law of universal gravitation. Now before I continue, I'd like to mention that this is one of the four fundamental forces in nature. In fact, we only have four forces that effectively um, contribute to the entire universe's uh, interactions with one another. Two exist inside the nucleus and two exist outside the nucleus. And the four forces are the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, gravity, and electrostatic attraction. Now the strong nuclear force is why atoms stay together. In the nucleus, all of the protons typically try to repel each other. As you learned in chemistry, like charges repel. So you have a bunch of protons in a nucleus, well, they're not going to want to stay in that nucleus. Well, the strong force comes along and actually binds them together and keeps them um, stable. The weak nuclear force is responsible for radioactivity. Now, we can use radioactivity to carbon date things, and we can use radioactivity to power um, nuclear power plants. but um, what happens is we have a weak hold on the protons and the atom actually breaks apart. So as it breaks apart, it's actually forming new materials. It breaks down into uh, more stable atoms. After that, we have the two that exist outside the nucleus, and that's gravity, which means, as I said before, every other object is attracted to every other object in the universe. So right now you are being pulled by every object that exists in the universe. You're pulled by the chairs near you, the television near you, the people around you, and uh, planets and solar systems and galaxies that are light years away. The problem is, as we get farther away from an object, that force gets weaker. But what does exist is the value that you could calculate, even if it's many, you know, decimal point and many zeros, for any two objects in the universe. Now the reason we're all attracted to the Earth um, more readily than one another or the other objects in, on the planet is because the Earth is so much bigger. And because of that big mass, it is, um, I guess, winning the tug of war between, let's say, the moon or the sun or any other planet in our solar system. Now, the electrostatic forces, the electromagnetic forces, exist between charged particles. And what happens is, anytime you have a positive and a negative um, particle, they're going to attract each other. If you have two positives, they're going to repel. Two negatives, they're going to repel. So like charges repel and unlike charges attract. And what we'll find is that the equation for gravity and electromagnetism or electrostatic forces um, are effectively the same type. They look the same. They have the same structure. And the main difference is the constants that we're going to use to calculate them. In fact, the gravitational constant, which is so important, it's on the front page of our reference table, is going to be a value of 10 to the negative 11. Whereas the value for the electrostatic constant with electricity 
is going to be times 10 to the 9, positive 9. So we have a big discrepancy between the gravitational constant of um, the universal gravitational constant and the electrostatic constant. We'll get to the electrostatic constant a little later. But for now, it's important to realize that there are four forces in the universe that effectively govern how the universe works. Now, Newton realized that objects were attracted to each other. He discussed the law of inertia, F equals MA, and action-reaction pairs in his Principia de Mathematica. Now, what he tried to do is extend that farther and determine how to, how to calculate the force between any two objects. And what he first thought about is objects that are in circular motion. He was postulating that if we fire cannonballs from top of a mountain, they will land on the Earth's surface. And we'll be able to calculate that using projectile motion equations. Well, if we shoot them farther, they're going to have a bigger range. If we shoot them faster still, they're going to have even a bigger range. Well, eventually you'll be able to shoot an object fast enough so that it will actually become an orbit around the Earth. Well, that orbit is going to be a centripetal force. Well, what he was able to do was combine the centripetal force and the, centrip and the gravitational force into one equation. And I'm co of course, I'm simplifying it. But what he was able to do is take um, his work along with Kepler's laws of planetary motion, and he was able to come up with an equation that, he, that has, has more recently been dubbed as Newton's law of universal gravitation. The problem is he didn't have the constant that was able to turn the proportionality into an equal sign. Basically what he said is larger objects have more gravitational force than smaller objects. So the bigger an object is, the more gravity it has to other objects. The other part of it is that the proximity of objects denotes an indirect square relationship with the force of gravity. So as I get farther away from objects, I'm going to decrease my gravitational force of attraction between them. Now, gravi gravitational forces are always attractive. But then when we talk about the other forces later, like electrostatic forces, they could be repulsive as well. So the bottom line is Newton's law of universal gravitation has become F equals big G M1 M2 over R squared. The big G is the universal gravitational constant. Henry Cavendish had a hand in that. And the M's are masses, mass of object one, mass of object two. And the radius is, is the distance between them to their center points. Now, some textbooks denote that as MM over D squared because it's distance between them. But most textbooks and the reference table is going to use big G, M1, M2 over R squared. Now, using that equation is going to be, um, I think, the most difficult part for us because we're dealing with large objects, if we're talking about planetary objects, and also large distances. So we're going to have to be very familiar with using the exponent keys on our calculator. And depending upon the calculator you have, that's going to prove to be tricky at first. But if you continue to work through it, you'll find that it gets easier. Remember, physics isn't magic. It's just science. So we're going to be able to calculate um, the force of gravity between any two objects. Now, this may help you in your social life. You'll be able to calculate how attractive you are to other people. Remember, though, the closer you are to them, the more attractive you are. But remember, don't invade other people's personal space. All right, we're going to look at a cannon firing a cannonball from the top of the Empire State Building, and it's going to make an orbit around the Earth and then come back. Now, if the cannon is fired from that height, what we need to do is determine how far away it is from the center of the Earth. Now, the radius of the Earth is 6.4 times 10 to the 6 meters. So that's the radius of the Earth. And that means the radius of the cannon is going to be 6.4 times 10 to the 6 meters plus 443. 
Now, as the cannon orbits the Earth, if this is the Earth, and the ball is traveling around the Earth, why is it going to orbit the Earth? Well, it's because it's being pulled inward by the force due to gravity. So the force due to gravity is going to contribute to the centripetal force. Now, force of gravity is mass times g, and we have mv squared over r on the other side. So the mass of the cannonball itself doesn't matter because it cancels out. Now, in this case, if g is 9.8 meters per second squared, v squared is what we're looking for, and we know the radius to be 6.4 e6 plus 443. And that 443 is not going to contribute too much, but it becomes 6400443 meters. Cross multiply, and then take the square root. So that times 9.8, and then second square root, second answer. We have the velocity is 7919.9 meters per second.